You're listening to a Whales or Whales production. You're also listening to Whales. Visit whalesorwhales.com for more projects and shows like this one. Hello, and welcome to Third Person, a storytelling podcast. This is episode 10, Nonfiction and Storytelling. We'll go into what exactly we mean by that later, but right now, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm your host, Brian, and my co-host and friend, Abigail. Hello, Abigail. Aloha. Oh, wow. Being Hawaiian today. (laughs) I know. You're mixing it up. I know all the languages. All of them? All of them. What is hello in Mandarin? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry that's if your, I just offended your, anyone who actually you, knows Mandarin and is listening to this. Yeah, I mean, that's probably <laughs> unlikely, but technically possible. So It is um, very possible, and I, I probably just alienated them from our podcast, so you are welcome. Great. Um, our two, you listeners, have our listeners, two now, listeners who our, happen to be Mandarin. Yeah, our two listeners, they're gone, so I'm sorry about that. Dang it. Y'all didn't um, want to hear this anyways. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this isn't worth listening to anyway. So you're best getting alienated right up front. Exactly. Uh, man, I mean, if we're going to lose you, we're going to lose you early. It did not take me very long to prove your lie. Out. <laughs> I'm not a very good liar. <laughs> what is hello in German? You should know that. I oh, forgot. Gosh. Oh, no. I oh, hi. <laughs> it's hi. It's hi. Hello. That's one of them. It's hello. Uh, guten oh, okay. Tag, if you're saying good morning. I know that. All right. But if you're going to be informed, it's morning, Abigail. It's evening. So. Huh? It's evening. It's it's evening. So what do you say? Nacht. That's night. There you go. Good enough, Ed. Night. All right. Good enough. (laughs) Nacht. (laughs) Nacht. That totally sounded terrible. It does. I'm alienating our German audience now. Great. Our thriving German audience, Abigail. I'm I'm just just a stupid American, y'all guys. Like, I don't know anything. But the question is, how do you say hello in Mormonese? Mormons uh, have their own language, correct? Right? <laughs> hello, my name is Mother <laughs> Price. <laughs> that was a really good answer. Thank you. All right. Now that we've alienated our Mormon listeners, our German <laughs> listeners, and our Mandarin listeners, we are ready to begin the podcast. Awesome. Um, <laughs> we, they had to be vetted, okay? Yes. Yeah, so today's topic is going to be interesting. Um Unlike all of our other topics, because basically we're going to want to discuss the idea of nonfiction in storytelling and then using storytelling when writing nonfiction. And they're two different but similar aspects. And they were actually recommended by someone you might know, Abigail. Are you aware of this Ariel person? Um, Who's that? Uh, I don't know. She mentioned that she like grew up with you or something. Oh, she did. Oh, oh, she's that girl who was like always hanging out in my room or something. Right. Um, yeah. She's. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I thought my parents like rented out of bed or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently she's your sister or, or so goes the word on the great. Oh, OK, that's but, cool. Hi, Ariel. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Man, you forgot your roots fast. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It I'm like a bad. gnat. I have a very s- small <laughs> memory. And apparently lifespan. Anyways, moving on. (laughs) So yeah, Ariel recommended this idea, and I liked it a lot as she started explaining it more to me. So I'm excited to talk about that soon. But first, Abigail, we need to talk about the catchy segment, What Have You Been Narratively Involved With? (laughs) Which we are not renaming. That's (laughs) terrible. Oh, what have I been narratively involved with? Yeah, because you know you've listened to so many stories and read yep. so many books, and I've I've been I've been narratively. But <laughs> <laughs> you speak so well and articulately. Mostly my dreams. Actually, I wish it was my dreams because then that would mean I'd be sleeping. Um, oh, wow. I have actually. Okay. okay. So quick aside. Do you actually have interesting dreams? Because my dreams are horrible. Well, I mean, I would define a horrible dream as still interesting, but I mean, but no, the- not horrible as in bad. Horrible as in like doesn't make sense, and I can never remember it. Well, I have a lot of those, but a lot okay. of times I will have one that I remember too, and I'll just get up and I'll write it down or something, so I don't forget. That's a good idea. But, I need to do that more. Yeah, no. Sometimes <laughs> I know the actually the other day I woke up super early and I was like, well, my alarm hasn't gone off, so it's not six yet, so I'll just lay uh-huh. here. 
Um, but I got nervous. <laughs> oh, those are the best kind of dreams. Yeah. I got nervous, though, that my alarm simply didn't go off because I was like, there's no mm-hmm. way that it's still before six. So right. I purposely pulled myself out of the dream, which I remember being really interesting. But now that I pulled mm-hmm. myself out of it, I can't remember it at all. It ended up being 430. But, you know, I lost <laughs> my dream. <laughs> yeah. Um, it would be really awesome if we could, like, find someone who's actually smart about, like, uh, psychology and have them on the show to talk about storytelling and dreams. That would be fascinating. That would actually be really cool. Because it would be, like, complete guesswork for us. But I would love to hear, like, how storytelling intersects with how stories are told in your own mind. Um, that would actually be really cool. Let's put that in the little barrel of ideas. <laughs> the barrel of ideas. Yes. yes. <laughs> Our very high the idea barrel. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Anyway, Abigail. Uh, so yeah, narratively involved with other than your wonderful dreams. I realized um, just now that I've actually been narratively involved in two things. Oh, wow. Um, the, the one that I told you about already was my poetry homework because um, right. I am in a poetry class right now for college. Mm-hmm. And I've actually been doing my work, which is kind of wow. new for me. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've been reading that and actually <laughs> I skip a lot of the poems. So I'm really mm. not that narratively involved in it, but it's been very interesting to be looking at some new things and kind of learning some new ways to use language. That's mostly what I'm taking it for. Um, I'm not a poet and I'm sure I never will be, but it's an interesting exercise because you have to learn how to use, use language. Mm-hmm. I guess morph it to your will. Um, you have to choose the exact right words to say exactly what you mean, but also mean something else. Um, or, you know, have things do two things at once. Or right. if you want to do rhythm or rhyme, that's really, <laughs> that's really tough. So it was interesting to be learning about that and get to read some of that. Um, that's fun. Yeah. But the have other, you, uh, mm-hmm. the only thing I remember from the poetry I did through college was, uh, the, the tiger from William Blake. Have you run across that yet? I'm sure I have. Um, my favorite part is this, this line that has always stuck with me, which goes, what the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? <laughs> Potentially my favorite line in all of poetry. Okay, I may not have read that. <laughs> I, you would remember it if you did. I would um, remember that. I just absolutely love that writing. It's, it's beautiful. It, it speaks is. volumes. That's kind of glorious. I think it was like my Skype status for a very long time is in what furnace was thy brain? <laughs> It that's it reminds me of a song that my mom used to sing to us about Gladys with like mm-hmm. le- legs like toothpicks and a neck like a giraffe ruff 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 and anyway she falls down the drain because she's so skinny um and wow. so that's kind of yeah that's kind of what that just reminded me of and now I'm thinking of the drain as a furnace and she died so you do remember your childhood I you do you haven't cut all ties yeah I remember the horrifying bits. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, those do tend to stick with us, I suppose. Exactly. Um, Why am I a tortured uh, artist? Before the show, (laughs) before the show, you were telling me about uh, a particular poem about a vampire cat lady. (laughs) I was. The poem is called "Curse of the Catwoman," Um, Mm -hmm. and despite the name, it's not actually about a cat. Uh, It's about a vampire, which is very interesting. Twist. I know, and I'm wondering if the whole vampire thing is another metaphor or if Ooh, that's I legit the story. Um, and I mean, it could be, but it could also just be a weird story because um, it's basically using the metaphor of like cat people mm-hmm. as representing the vampires, <laughs> and it's uh-huh. it's very interesting. It's about a, a man and a a man and a vampire woman, I suppose, who fall in love, <laughs> and uh, they can't. They can't come in contact because she knows that if they do, she's going to succumb to her nature and devour him. See, this is already like a break from tradition, but it seems like whenever there are vampires, it's the non-vampire uh, girl falling in love with the vampire yeah, guy. Yeah, it really is. Um, so, so this I, is like turning on its head. Yeah. yeah, and I liked that it wasn't like dumb, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, this actually won't work. Cool. Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> no, this actually won't work. Yeah, it actually won't work. They tried, but uh, he ends up killing her. Yep. So, ah, so it's about spoilers. death. So it is indeed a poem. Yes, it is indeed a poem because it is about death. He ends up killing her. But here's the thing that really makes it a poem: it's mm-hmm. okay. Oh wow! Because now instead of just being dead, she's been released from the curse that she's under. Yes, that so, is very interesting. Yeah, it's very poetic. Um, it was very interesting. It's one of the few poems that I stopped and went, oh, i got to read this all the way through. Huh. 
I usually so just my, read like the first couple lines. My only question about the the Catwoman from, you know, a poetic analytical sense is in what furnace was thy brain? Uh, the left one. Oh, see? I, I thought it was supposed to be ambiguous. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. No, it was actually the left one. There's like two. All right. Um, okay. And they're over there in the corner. And so the right the one has the tiger brain in it. Yeah. And then the left one. Exactly. Okay. And the left one has the cat woman brain in it. See, that all makes sense now. It does. It does. Poetry is always such a mystery to me. See, this is why I you know. take college courses, people. Exactly. You it get smarter and you learn it, about cat women. So that's cool. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> um, but for real, the, the other thing that I just realized that I've been involved with recently yep. um, has been an audio book. Um, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. I've gone through this one before, but I was just going out running and was like, well, I need something to listen to. Hey, that's on here. So I started listening to that again, and it's still just as good as I remember. Um, I know I mentioned this last time, but my favorite thing about it is just his conversational tone, which, you know, makes mm-hmm. sense because it was written for the radio. Right. But it's it always baffles me when I listen to this book because I'm going, wow, these are such complex topics he's thinking about. He's explaining it in a foolproof right. way that is also very easy to understand and yeah. take in. He had a real so, gift for that. Yeah. And I mean, speaking of storytelling and nonfiction, he was great at it. He does like extended metaphor and a like lot just of that. Yeah. Slips in a metaphor and a parable like mm-hmm. throughout his point making and really like well articulated ways. One reason really book, solid metaphors too. Yeah, one reason that book reads so well is because it was originally delivered as radio addresses. Mm-hmm. So it like has this charismatic, like he's talking to you feel about it. Exactly. And I I know there's the there's even um an introduction before it where he's like, Yeah, so I actually wrote this pretty poorly because it's on the radio. So I use things like contractions, which I don't believe belong in text. And I thought that was uh-huh. kind of funny. So I'm like, oh, how the world has changed. <laughs> now we have recently, blogs. <laughs> now we have blogs and everything's doomed. Everything's doomed. Yeah, I recently doomed. found a an interesting, speaking of mere Christianity, an interesting philosophical book from someone who is also writing like in the late 40s, to early 50s, mm-hmm. um, who is also writing philosophically, who is also writes a lot like C.S. Lewis in terms of being like very approachable and trying to take a complex subject and make it like yeah. a short book that explains it. But he's like an Episcopal uh, priest who became um, like Buddhist. Interesting. Basically, or at least like Eastern in thought. So yeah. it's like, it's really fascinating to read at, just as someone who's interested in comparative uh, philosophies because it's like a guy writing just like C.S. Lewis and making very similar argument styles and talking about the same problem C.S. Lewis is talking about, which is that was like the age where science was kind of usurping religion and everyone mm-hmm. was like uncertain of what the future was going to be in terms of philosophically, but making points from a Buddhist perspective instead of a Christian perspective. Yeah. But they're like so similar in writing styles. And it was just fascinating to me That's to really find cool. someone like a contemporary of C.S. Lewis who had a different viewpoint, who was also an Episcopal priest and C.S. Lewis was Episcopal. So uh-huh. like they're, they're very similar people. So I thought that was kind of a fascinating uh, book to read. Yeah, that's really cool. What is it called? Oh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, the name of it, I can, it'll be in my Amazon. It's something about anxiety, uh, but I don't remember the full title. But it is in my Amazon thing. Ah, The Wisdom of Insecurity, A Message for an Age of Anxiety by Alan W. Watts. Huh. That's a very interesting title. I'll have to pick that up eventually. Yeah, it's a, it's a super cool read. It's definitely interesting and just written super well. I got like halfway through it in one night just because it's so easy to 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 get through, even though he's nice. talking about like super deep stuff. So it's it's really enjoyable. That's pretty cool. That's the kind of stuff that makes you feel smarter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because they write in a way that isn't li- that is uh, you don't really have to work too hard to understand it. It's giving you complex concepts, but not in a way that you need to work to mm-hmm. realize them. And yeah. it does that by using storytelling in a lot of ways. Oh, so. bring it back to the topic, why don't you? Yeah, <laughs> I'm awesome like that because I'm so smart. Yeah, but that is actually um, the one thing that makes nonfiction bearable in my mind because nonfiction <laughs> without storytelling is so dry. And that's one reason that everyone hates textbooks. I was about to say, I nonfiction that I love reading is like history stuff, but then I realize history is basically one giant story. It really is. So, it's one giant story. Yeah. So history books are in uh, kind of by essence, they are storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, what have, is that everything you've been uh, narratively involved with recently? I mean, besides every once in a while watching an episode of Friends, but that's just going to come that up every can't podcast. can't count, can it? Uh, I love okay, so I'm Friends. Is, is it good storytelling? It is really good storytelling, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's formulaic, and you can, mm-hmm. all, like, the, the, the jokes come on a beat. 
So course, you can yeah. pretty much guess when they're going to come because it's a sitcom. However, the the characters themselves are so vastly different from each other and mm-hmm. have such quippy lines and have such personality. And the actual overall story arc is through every single episode. Um, so it does make it very interesting to watch still. Um, I mean, each episode can be enjoyed by itself. You just mm-hmm. don't know what's happening around it. I mean, you can still enjoy a self-contained story, but the relationships between the characters are changing with every episode and things like that. So I've found it as one of the superior sitcoms. Um, right. So where does it rank in your pantheon of sitcoms? Your very top? Probably. Wow. So yeah. above uh, above what's it, How I Met Your Mother. Pro- it's hard to say um, because to me, How I Met Your Mother is a reboot of Friends. Oh really? So they're pretty much oh. the same show. I mean, of course, I mean, of course, the characters are different and the story is different, but mm-hmm. it's the same idea that it's just this group of friends that you follow throughout their life. Right. Um, I mean, instead of meeting in a coffee shop, they meet in a bar. That's pretty much the only <laughs> difference. So nice. I really enjoy both of them a lot. Uh, friends is a little cleaner, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. It's not that much cleaner, but it's a little yeah. bit less. Uh, I, I remember guess remember being. Less direct. Yeah, I remember it being kind of like cutting edge for its time, yeah. but that was like the 90s or something. Oh, so. yeah. No, it was definitely cutting edge. But like at the same time, if my little brother was watching it, he probably wouldn't know exactly what they're talking about all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. With how much mother it's a little bit worse. But I don't know. They're still mm-hmm. both pretty bad, but I love, I love them. <laughs> all right. What does that say about you, Abigail? That's oh, the real question. Oh, well, <laughs> anyone who knows me. <laughs> uh, so, I, I don't see the harm in in a, in a dirty joke every once in a while. <laughs> yep, exactly. Except on this podcast. Where Except we are on this podcast where we want a friendly. clean writing. <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, we won't. Uh, you won't catch us dropping f bombs every other word. <laughs> we'll try. Granted, not you to. won't in friends either. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, well, that that sounds like a good time. Um, it sounds like a low energy. Um, a low energy show to keep up with. Yeah, low energy, like high quality. Nice like I would yep. say, as compared to something like Big Bang Theory, where I just hate mm-hmm. myself for watching it. Um, yep. I don't actually hate myself for watching Friends, yet I still don't have to put in a ton of energy. Yeah, see, I, I approve it. of this over Big Bang Theory. The yeah. little I've seen of that show, it, it seems irredeemable. <laughs> it is pretty irredeemable. I don't know why I've watched so much of it. I've I've watched irredeemable shows before, so it's okay. <laughs> I've watched, yeah, really bad shows sometimes, and it's just like, man, these are stupid. Yeah, but because they're TV shows, they once you start, they can hook you. Oh yeah, I, I just have this sense of I need to accomplish something and I need to finish the show. <laughs> it's, that's one reason exactly. I don't really watch cop shows. Um, I've been told to watch House repeatedly, and mm-hmm. I need to do this. And I've been told to start in the middle, but it's really hard for me to start in the middle because I'm like, ah, oh, but then I haven't yeah. seen the whole show. Speaking of cop shows that apparently get, uh better later on yeah i'm gonna stand in for steven here our our missing panelist for people who know the show i didn't even notice he was gone oh dear wow where do you go that says something about about him it says how darn similar he is to me Um, so (laughs) does it say something about me it might say something about you as well you Mm. you heartless fiend i know what furnace is thy brain all right (laughs) it's in the right one (laughs) So Stevens, you're a tiger. Anyway, Stevens busy today, and but he has caught up to where I am in Supernatural. Nice. Um, and he basically uh, agrees with me about it now. So, um, <laughs> so I wait, knew. Where given are time, you? What season are you in? I'm not in. I'm just like twelve episodes in. Um, so I'm not very far. It hasn't gotten great yet, but I thought it w- had a lot of potential and is pretty enjoyable. And he thinks the same thing. Um, oh, okay. I thought he was way further than you for some reason. No, no, not in, uh, not in Supernatural. Um, I have a friend who's gotten super far in it, but that friend is not Steven. Um, yeah, I think we're both like up to episode 15 or something in the first season. So we've not made it far, but the reason he was catching up with me is we're probably going to start watching it together now. Nice. Um, cause it's a really fun type of show to do that for. Uh, and yeah, it, it continues to get better and tell much uh, more intricate stories and have much better character development through them. So hopefully it continues on this path of being focused more on the story and less on just, ooh, it's a scary monster. Mm-hmm. Boo. Boo. Um, so yeah, I that's hate what. That. That's just. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> so, so that's what he's uh he's been up to uh i haven't really been involved with much narratively the only thing i have been doing lately is i have been playing through the original resident evil um which is a that game sounds interesting a horror game that was released i think in like 1999 maybe a little bit earlier on the original playstation 
Um, very old game, but they made a remaster of it and like updated all the visuals oh, wow. and sound and stuff on Steam recently. That's uh, really cool. And my friend highly recommended it, so I'm trying it out. It's an interesting game because the storytelling is both fantastic and terrible. Um, okay. And here's <laughs> here's kind of how that works. So it's a horror game. The premise is you are a military uh, investigator who is looking into a rash of murders that has been happening recently of people who are being eaten. Um, already, fantastic opening. Yeah. And so I'm digging so this. It's, so it's this cutscene of you walking through a forest, and then these rabid, crazy dogs attack your team and chase you into an old, abandoned mansion. Mm-hmm. So it's just classic horror. <laughs> crazy dogs chase you into a mansion. You're stuck there. You need to find a way to survive and regroup with the rest of your peers. Mm-hmm. Um, so the story itself, like the voice acting and the uh, writing and the plot events are awful. It's just like <laughs> B-movie horror. I mean, this story... The the voice acting, I need to show you some voice clips in this game later because they are legendarily horrible. <laughs> like they are known to be some of the worst in video games because the game was developed in Japan in oh. an era where they were really cheap about bringing it over here. So yeah. not only was the translation poor, but they hired like the cheapest voice actors possible. How about going down to check by yourself? I have a rope here. Oh, do you? Well, then I'll try to go down using the rope. Luckily, the voice acting is slightly updated for the remaster. It's not the original, like, terrible stuff, but the writing is still so off that you can't, like, take any of the actual story beats seriously. Mm -hmm. However, what's interesting about the game is most of the game itself does not take place in cutscenes or story at all. It's about the actual playing of it. Mm -hmm. And it creates a very interesting story in that respect because it, it creates horror in a way that actually makes you feel rather powerless, which is something that games don't do very much anymore. There's a slight renaissance about it, but how mainstream games have become a great example of something like Assassin's Creed, where they try to make you feel like the super powerful, you can kill anything, like, um, the raddest guy alive. They mm-hmm. give you all the weapons you need. They make combat really simple. They let you know, kill 10 people in a row and keep running along your merry way and very much focus on just making you, the player, feel powerful and you, the player, feel cool. And that's kind of how modern games have become. They've become much like Hollywood movies. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting about Resident Evil is there is like not enough ammo in this game to kill every zombie that is in this mansion. That's so scary. even if you cannot kill everything. <laughs> so I started playing the game for about 45 minutes. Um, and I literally ran out of ammo and couldn't get anywhere. And I talked to Cameron, uh, my friend and fellow podcaster who's played through this game a lot. And I'm like, Cameron, help him out of ammo. And he's like, okay, you're playing the game wrong. You can't just kill everything in this game. It's not a game where you it's just go through sur- and see an so enemy. So it's about surviving, not like winning. Exactly. It's wow. truly a survival horror game. And that's really interesting is you're having to make your way through this mansion and solve the puzzles, but the zombies are scary, not just because, oh, it's a combat encounter. I have to kill it. It's like, do I waste my precious resources on this or do I run? Um, do mm-hmm. I try to find a way around him? Do I go a different path? Can I find a safe room and get more ammo? So there's like this constant tension to everything and tell, and makes a really like involving s- story you create throughout it because it's also like a very open ended game. You can do things in a lot of different orders. So you're like exploring this mansion that's telling the story to you and kind of becomes a character of its own. And you're constantly paranoid about conserving the precious resources you have and not wasting them. Mm-hmm. And it's like it plays on fear because when something jumps out at you or you misjudge a camera angle and suddenly you're walking right into a zombie, you might waste very precious ammo just trying to get out of that situation and shooting him with a shotgun blast, mm-hmm. which is not the smart thing to do, but it's what your panicked mind did. Yeah. So it's a really interesting way of like pulling on fear and making a slow build up to fear rather than just jump scares and violence, which mm-hmm. a lot of other horror likes to likes to use. So. So I have a question for you. Yes. Do you play this in the dark? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's the only way to play a horror game. That sounds really great. That actually, I mean, it reminds me of the, the one of like two other horror games that I actually really know about, Mm -hmm. um, which is called something. Okay. I just had the name. Starts with Amnesia? Nope. It's the other one. Oh, Penumbra? Penumbra. Yeah. Yes. It's a little similar to that in that that game is about running, not fighting. Yes, it is about running and not fighting. Um, and in that game, I seem to recall, I mean, I didn't play Amnesia, but I did see mm-hmm. a lot of Penumbra played it when my brother played it. Um, yes. Whenever, like, something scary began to happen, your character actually started freaking out. Yeah. And you had to, like, look, look at a wall and you didn't know what was happening. And so a lot of that was the fear of the unknown, which mm-hmm. is actually what a lot of the fear in books and movies are based on. And so when I see a game that actually plays on that... 
Um, and same thing with Resident Evil. It's the fear of the unknown because you don't have enough ammo. Yeah, you enter a room and you're like, please say there's nothing in here. <laughs> exactly. That sounds like it's actually gripping. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I'm enjoying it a lot. I've actually been like streaming it out so my friend can watch me. And nice. uh, he has been enjoying that a lot. Um, and yeah, it's, it does zombies right because zombies, how a lot of people have addressed it as well, zombies are dumb and slow. So I guess we just need to throw hundreds of them at you. Yeah. Um, but this kind of takes the idea of the scary thing about zombies is how, um, how much they can withstand and how just by grading you down, you will die before they die. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of, it's the survivability of zombies that is so scary. Even yeah. when you kill them, they come back to life again. So it's this <sighs> idea of like, you just have to hope you, just you can can't survive. Win. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There that's was actually awesome. one. One really funny moment where there's a zombie laying on the ground and I'm like, oh man, it would be so mean if like he, he stands up when I walk past him, like a zombie is playing dead. Um, and I walked past him and I was wrong. I'm like, oh, he's not actually playing dead. Okay, cool. I walked past the next zombie and he was playing dead. <laughs> double so tap, double tap. Me. And yeah, that totally freaked me out. So yeah. I've been burning every zombie corpse that come across now. <laughs> Just to be double sure. So yeah, that's been really cool. Uh, just fun to go back to this gaming, uh, like really a relic now as games go, like almost yeah. like 25 years old or 15 years old and it still holds up in a lot of ways. So that's awesome. Interesting storytelling in a non-traditional sense, considering the actual storytelling in that game is so awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we can move on now to our main topic, Yay. nonfiction and storytelling. Um, so thank you, Ariel, again, for uh, suggesting this. She is also the person who has been in charge of getting her stuff up on YouTube. Woohoo, and I'm very thankful for her for doing that. Unfortunately, she has a horrible computer and horrible internet connection, so it's been very hard for her to actually edit the videos. Um, yeah. So if they're ever late, blame technology. Um, but yes, she's been working hard on that front. I was really nervous. I thought you were going to say, if they were ever late, blame her. And I'm like, no! <laughs> no, I'm not that mean. <laughs> I, I respect people's time and the effort they put into this stuff. Absolutely. Um, even if they have terrible technology, not their fault. Um, so this is an interesting topic because it's really two pronged. One idea is the idea of nonfiction and storytelling. And the other is using storytelling when writing nonfiction. And first, we are going to cover the one I said first, which is nonfiction in storytelling. Um, the first obvious question here is what do we mean by this? Um, and basically what we mean by it is the idea of nonfiction works existing within a fictional world. An example of this would be like a book about the fictional world that someone in that fictional world reads. Mm-hmm. Um, or it might be like a – trying to think of other examples beyond just books. General that exist lore in um, passed down orally. It could be a tradition. Right. It could be a um, – like a, a folk story. That seems mm-hmm. to be a really popular one um, when, you know, characters are going and someone's like, oh, well, here's this story that no one knows if it's actually true, but it's become a part of their nonfiction. Exactly. So basically just think about what nonfiction is in the real world and then think about that existing within a fictional context. Mm-hmm. Um, within a story you're reading, they have nonfiction. Um, so some examples of this being done in fiction. The first one that popped to mind and my mind and one that uh, Ariel brought up is in the Elder Scrolls games, there is a lot of lore existing in that world in the form of like books and scrolls and stuff that you can find mm-hmm. in the various um, various areas of the game. And what's interesting about that world in that game is they have put like ludicrous amounts of thought into the lore and the world surrounding those games. I have read a book about the theology of the game's religions that was more complex than actual theology books I've read. Like, that's how much that thought that the developers have really put into that world. So even when I was very young and didn't really even think about any of this, I was playing Morrowind and just was blown away by how much there was to learn about that world just by the in-game texts Mm -hmm. that were written like books within that world. It gives you such a window into what that game does. Um a lot of high fantasy games do similar concepts. Something like uh, Dragon Age has a codex that you unlock entries in as you go along. It does a really good way um, of teaching you information. Something they've done that's really interesting later on in the Dragon Age games is like you'll find uh, the codex entries won't just be like describing what something is, but they'll describe it by like showing a letter from someone about this uh, particular monster or showing a excerpt from a book about this particular place so they're like pull from all these different sources of writing within the world to explain the world around you which is really Mm -hmm. interesting uh what are some other examples abigail that you've run across um the one that came to my mind the very first and you actually wrote down in some of your notes was the lord Mm -hmm. of the rings um when i think of nonfiction and ow 
I just hurt myself. Oh dear. What did you do? <laughs> I stubbed my toe and I'm sitting. Wow. I know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's impressive, impressive. actually. <laughs> <laughs> when I think of nonfiction in a fictional world, the first thing I think yes. of actually is the story of Baron and Luthien. Oh, um, that's an excellent one. Yeah, because there's this scene, it's right in the beginning of, Lord, of the, the Fellowship of the Ring when, um, it's right before Frodo gets stabbed by one of the Nazgul. And they're kind of camping out and, uh, Aragorn or Strider, as he's called at that time, is yes. singing a song of Baron and Luthien. And mm-hmm. that story itself, the, the cool thing is, I mean, Tolkien had actually written that whole story out. And gave a condensed right. version of it here just to add flavor to the world. Um, but Lord of the Rings is really cool in that it, it didn't necessarily create a world and then begin to explain it away with lore and text and whatnot. Um, Tolkien actually did it backwards and created all the lore and the text and then created a world from that. Exactly. Um, the Lord of the Rings proper was actually just him trying to tell a history of his much. existing world. Yeah, like absolutely. it is not like I need to create lore so I can make a fictional work in it. it not was at just all. Kind of, he just happened to, write a to language. love etymology and love history and love languages, and he just mm-hmm. played around in it, and then went, "Hey, let's tell a story in it." So that's right. It's really cool. And then after his death, of course, his his uh, his son organized his notes together and published the Cimmerillion, which is pretty much the lore of the world. So it's really interesting to be able to go back and read that. And then mm-hmm. you can put everything else in the context of that because you get you get to hear in Lord of the Rings about how it's the third age. Um, you know, right. it's the third age, it's the age of men, but then you're like, well, what about ages one and two? Um, you mm-hmm. get to read about that in the Cimmerillion. So it's kind of cool to see how things progressed and see, you know, the bad guys go from one age to the next to you know, where they ended up, how Sauron became the way he is and things like that. It just adds a lot of flavor. Yeah, and I think that's one reason, partially because Lord of the Rings started it, but also because of just how they're written, why epic fantasies are so big in these uh, nonfiction existing in their mm-hmm. worlds is they typically create a larger context of a world before they then create substories within it. So they need a way to tell you about all that other lore out there. And nonfiction is a great way to do it. Because mm-hmm. all that lore does exist within that world. It's just like history in our world. Absolutely. Um, it's a great I, way to just solidify the idea that the world exists because you're not going to have a world that doesn't have nonfiction written in it. Right. And that's one reason I love uh, epic fantasies so much is I love stories that like have a world and then say, let's create a story in this world rather than have a story and say, I need to create a world that supports this story. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I like the thinking behind creating i think it also lets you create more inventive stories because you can just even creating a small um seemingly unimportant story can still be a large story because it points to all these other bigger frameworks you created around Mm -hmm. it um speaking of that that's actually something and i know it's because they're based on the epic fantasy mm fantasy but that's actually something you see in a lot of role-playing games as well oh absolutely (laughs) Uh, yeah it'll take hours and hours and hours to put together a campaign that the game master will lead the players through, but the players oh, yeah, like only get to see, yeah, like actual like sit down tabletop role play. Um, the players only get to see a small portion of what the mm-hmm. game master actually puts together, but there's all these places that you can, you know, you can learn about how the world was put together or what's going on. Um, and you may or may not even get to it. So it's much more like a real life experience as you're kind of walking around in this little exactly pretend place something else interesting um an an interesting example of this is like in historical fiction um Mm -hmm. sometimes people are able to use nonfiction and tie it into their storytelling really well it's almost a blend of this and storytelling and nonfiction an example of this for me is winds of war is like an epic that was written about a family in world war ii Mm -hmm. and something it does between each like part or each act it has these excerpts from a uh from a fictional nonfiction book. So mm. like one is written by a German general telling the history of the war as someone who worked w- on the German military side with Adolf Hitler. Um, and so they'll take these breaks between the actual story to have this fictional character basically writing a real history book about Germany and writing mm. it from this really interesting perspective. And that was one of the most memorable parts of the book for me because he is able to like create his own history within real history. That's really cool. And it was cool. fascinating. Yeah, I've always loved um, dramatized history, I guess right. is the best way to explain it. But when mm-hmm. it's actually nonfiction, these events actually happen. However, they're being told from like 
being told in such a way that it reads like a novel rather than a history book. You get to see inside their thoughts and stuff. So a lot of that's still made up. But that actually, you know, it's it go, kind of goes hand in hand with the whole um, – I'm losing all my words today. The the <laughs> Storytelling and nonfiction? Uh, the thing you just mentioned. Oh, good. <laughs> well, Fiction – Fictional history, historical fiction. Yes. There historical you go. Historical fiction. There you so go. So sorry, I got so little sleep. No, that's um, okay. But yeah, so like it goes hand in hand because it's historical. It, it's kind of like historical fiction, only mm-hmm. it actually happened. And those right. are the kinds of stories that I actually remember those events um, because, as I said earlier, no one likes to read a textbook. Um, yeah. People like to read stories, and a lot of what gets you engaged in the story is how that story plays on your emotions, whether you're going to admit it or not. That's what happens. Um, and so being able to see inside people's heads like that, especially someone who you would never sympathize with, um, you know, mm-hmm. you're not going to sympathize with a Nazi general, but once right. you see inside their head, it gets a little bit, you know, you start, that's when your perspective can kind of change. And so that's one reason I really, really like the dramatized histories, especially of, um, you know, characters that I wouldn't necessarily sympathize with. It's like, oh, Hey, look, they actually were people too. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, that was actually something that the, that specific book did is like, it was so interesting hearing a Nazi general who's like, well, the only reason we lost this war is because we like fought it inefficiently and Mm -hmm. like hearing other, hearing something other than just, oh, Germany lost the war when they went to war with Russia. Like hearing it from Germany, like, because since he was a high general, in the army, he was like trying to vindicate his own actions. Like mm-hmm. he was trying to say, listen, I supported going to war with Russia, but here's why it was going to work. And it was so interesting, like hearing, you know, something other than just another book telling you what happened. It's someone telling you with a personal stake in it. So mm-hmm. you knew to like take all his words with a grain of salt, but you could hear it from a different perspective. Absolutely. Um, and a really similar thing happened in, I mean, it's, it's not exactly a non fiction kind of thing, but a, a similar mm-hmm. thing happened in the boy with the striped pajamas. Um, right. His family was in Germany and you got to see some of the things that a tutor was teaching the young girl. And a lot of that, I don't know if that was uh, actual nonfiction propaganda that they were showing mm-hmm. or um, if some of that was, you know, made up. I'm sure a lot of it was made up. But this idea of the, these history books that are just written so whacked Um, Because he's Mm -hmm. legit reading a history book out to her about how, you know, Jews are the devil and stuff like that. And it's just kind (laughs) of creepy because you're going, oh, wow, this young impressionable girl is going to be completely turned because she's being told something that's twisted. Um, So it's interesting kind of seeing history twisted. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I really like it when uh, fictional worlds or even like historical fictional worlds bring in like educational materials is a great example of nonfiction, mm-hmm. not just like books people read, but like seeing a class that would be taught in this world mm-hmm. gives you a great idea of how the world works. Like what are they teaching their children? Mm-hmm. It's, it's that idea of seeing like what these people consume, not just like the stories and songs they consume, but like the, the facts they consume mm-hmm. in this world. And Absolutely. How they're similar to our I know something like that happened at the beginning of Serenity as well. They opened that up on a class. And right. It, I mean, I it, about that. at first, yeah, at first it looks a lot like you're learning, you know, history facts and whatnot, but then it becomes a little bit more clear that it's like, hey, I'm not sure all this really lines up. Right. Um, but we yeah. only know that because we're not young and impressionable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so any other examples for, for this or should we move on to, uh, f- to our second topic? Um, I think that actually covers it pretty well. I know we had a yeah, couple more written out, but. Wait, I think that it. covered it pretty well <laughs> as well. Um, so before we move on, just real quick, actually, I think we also covered the next thing I was going to talk about, which is just like, is this effective? And why is it effective? And I think we covered that in that it just adds a texture to the world. Yeah. Like, it, it makes helps the you world under- believable. Exactly. It makes the world believable and helps you understand it. Like when Aragorn sings that song or when you find that text in Dragon Age about another country, you realize the world is bigger than the story that's being told. Mm-hmm. Um it and that's helps. always to me an incredible feeling. Yeah, it also helps you understand the characters themselves. Um, cause you can, you, you learn through that song that Aragorn wants something more than what he's currently doing. So right. Strider exactly. is more than Strider. Strider is someone who is in love. Um, because. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like in the real world, you exist as a person, but the world doesn't revolve around you. You're one part mm-hmm. of a larger whole. Your story is affecting the world and the world is affecting your story. And sometimes I think stories can lose sight of that. And, you know, because it's a centered narrative, the protagonist becomes the center of the whole world. Mm-hmm. Um, but I find it very interesting when you realize there's a whole um, framework around the protagonist that's more important than the protagonist. And he's just one part of this. Absolutely. And then. Nonfiction works do an incredible job of bringing that to focus. I think that's one reason we like 
protagonists who are not like the all-knowing Superman type characters. Right. Because we like to see them learn those things and grow. And we're like, oh, hey, that's like me. I'm not the only one. Um, yep, exactly. And it's through a lot of that nonfiction that that happens. Yeah, Brandon Sanderson actually does a fantastic job of this in um, the – I was about to say the King Killer Chronicles, but that's Rothfuss. Uh, Patrick Rothfuss. <laughs> Way of in, Kings. In uh, Words of Radiance oh. um, and Way of Kings, yeah. And the Stormlight Archives, that's what the whole series is called. Because he actually has one of his characters, one of his primary characters is studying to be a scholar. Oh. Um, in that world. So she's constantly... Wait, wait, you have to study to be a scholar? Well, pretty much. <laughs> Doesn't studying like, make you a scholar? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Anyway, I don't remember on. if that's the exact title <laughs> she's working. That's actually... Uh, is scholar just mean you're studying? Like if I you mean, start taking elementary like, school, are you a scholar? Um, I thought it, like with Stubbometric Prestige or something. I, I think it's... It, well, we'll find out. Define scholar. Yeah, see, I want to know this. Thing. Like, it's <laughs> a probably specialist two different in a ways. particular branch of study, especially the humanities, a distinguished academic. Okay, so she's trying to become a distinguished academic. Oh, okay. Basically. Okay. Uh, I forget if it's a more specific role than that or not. There's a second definition here that says a person who is highly educated or has an aptitude for study. So that's where I got confused because I was thinking There you one. go. See, multiple meanings. Gotta love English. Look at that. Um, <laughs> so she is studying to be a scholar. Um, and so in that, like, you're constantly finding these different fields of study that the world works with, uh, the philosophers they follow, the types of religion mm. they study. Uh, and it's just fascinating to see, like, the, you know, the magical properties that, that exist in that world are just another school of thought they study, like we study science. So Brandon Sanderson has always done a fantastic job of creating non-fictional realities to like his magic systems and fantasies and making them feel yeah. like we treat science instead of just like they're shooting fireballs yeah um, so he doesn't and that is that is something to point out i guess as f- the difference between a someone who writes thrillers and someone who writes mm-hmm. epic fantasy um someone who likes i mean the, the different genres actually fall into a different style of reading and writing huh oh, surprise surprise <laughs> um, but the ones who write epic fantasies are usually the people who like history, the, hif- the people who like to create the world. Um, yeah. they still like to tell stories, but they're the, the joy of those stories comes from exploring the world, which is why it can leave a bad taste in someone's mouth. If they are more of a thriller lover or more of like a chick flick watcher, <laughs> me, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, who enjoys <laughs> the very small, tightly wound, you don't have to necessarily know a lot about this world to understand right um exactly it takes a very different type of reader that's true i think some of the best stories are the ones that create really personal stories within a vast Mm -hmm. world and those are like not everyone gets that across like i wouldn't say i think that's an example of like the hobbits in the lord of the rings were a fantastic job of that like Mm -hmm. the hobbits in the end were wrapped up in their own world there was that larger world that they're trying to help around them but their story was so personal and so relatable that you almost forgot you don't even need that framework for that story to be good that's um, I love Lord of the Rings for that. I think that that one gets such a wide audience because mm-hmm. he does the mixture so well, and it's really not that hard to understand. Exactly, and I think Brandon Sanderson is one of the better writers at doing mm-hmm. that. Um, and if like the Elder Scrolls is bad at it, there are no good characters in Elder Scrolls games, um, mm-hmm. and it's something unfortunate. Dragon Age is much much better at creating characters within a world, but it's so easy to get caught up in your own lore that you forget to actually make interesting people in it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see that happen way too often. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, absolutely. I think like Pathfinder and stuff can easily fall into that mm-hmm. as well. So, um, yeah, that that is – we did a surprisingly good job of wow. that. I didn't High expect five. us to yeah, – there we go. We're not actually in like the same room, so. <laughs> That's why our high we fives did. were not at the same time. Uh, exactly. <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm going to see that and say, why am I syncing up the files 43 <laughs> minutes in? <laughs> All right, so moving on to our second topic here, storytelling in nonfiction. Woo-hoo! Abigail, what the heck does this mean? Um, it means using the technique of storytelling to get across what you are trying to say. Um, storytelling in nonfiction is very different from nonfiction in storytelling because it has a completely different purpose. Mm-hmm. While it does have the similar purpose of trying to make it a little bit more colorful. Usually Mm -hmm. when you're telling nonfiction, you have some kind of agenda. Right. Whether you are trying to inform someone, trying to sell someone, trying to persuade someone, you always have an agenda when you're telling. There's an objective to writing it. Yeah. Except in the case of maybe like a journal. Yeah, exactly. There's usually an objective. And uh, from what I have seen, storytelling oftentimes um it kind of serves a couple purposes one would just be to you know illustrate your point 
mm-hmm. because people just think in stories, um, i.e. journal entries. <laughs> journal entries are just complete stories. There's mm-hmm. really nothing else. You know, I did this, I did that, I feel this way. Um, you know, he did that to me or whatever. Um, but it also brings a reader into the nonfiction a little bit more because it has uh, emotion tied in with it. And that's something that you're really going to need if you're going to persuade someone or if you're going to entice right. someone to do something. So that's why a lot of that is in um, those kinds of like speeches and mm-hmm. uh, copy and things like that have a lot of stories in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because storytelling, I mean, as we talked about in our first episode, it's like, it's really intrinsic to humans. They respond very strongly to stories. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to get something across, either just to teach them something and make it stick or trying to make them think a different way, you're going to tell them a story. Mm -hmm. And why look at all the (laughs) classic stories are like trying to get morals across. Yeah, um, absolutely. There's uh, Aesop's Fables. The first four books of the New Testament are is almost completely stories. Um, Anytime there's... um, I, I see speakers do this all the time. Um, mm-hmm. If you watch a lot of TED Talks or anything like that, bloggers do right. this all the time. They'll, they'll <laughs> open um, with a story. And one of my favorite people that does it the best uh, would be Jeff Myers. He uh, is a teacher. And he opens his talks with this really intriguing, really engaging story. And it's usually something that happened to him personally. And mm-hmm. then he'll tie that story into what he's saying. And so... I remember so many of his talks because I remember that story. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember actually what he talked about, but I remember <laughs> how he equated that story to his point and right. it's stuck with me ever since. And so I'm just like, oh my gosh, this guy is like amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it's just really persuasive. So like what are some some other examples you can here are like parables? That was a really good point mm-hmm. because if you look at the New Testament, like Jesus was a pretty, uh, or, or depending on your, 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 uh, your thoughts, like the people who, whoever wrote the gospel, <laughs> the direct, direct writings of Jesus or people who, who were, who were writing like yeah. translations. Um, really impressive storyteller. There's a I lot mean, of stories. And not to, because like he was trying to make moral points uh-huh. to people that weren't really willing to listen to them in a lot of ways or weren't really able to get them and were able to get them across by putting them in the form of storytelling. Mm-hmm. And um, not and that's even one just it's, like fanciful, fanciful storytelling. He was telling stories of like daily things, like at that time. Right. And he was exactly. using bits and pieces of their lives and then putting a point to it. Yeah, and that's what's really kind of interesting to see because people, you know, have a re- reverence for the original text. It's really interesting to see all these stories that don't apply to our modern life at all <laughs> still used because they're the original stories. So exactly. Like, you I find mean, we've them. grown up with them, so now we know what they mean intrinsically. Um, exactly. And it's so once that's why you so start many... delving into that culture that you really realize how potent that story actually was. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's the really fascinating thing. If you you see like how those people related to the story, mm-hmm. because he wasn't like using some timeless age. It was just mm-hmm. what it was his contemporaries. It's like exactly. now if he like used selfies to describe the image of God or something, it's, like, <laughs> it's just because that's what we would relate with. I really want to write a blog about that now. It's like when, when he spoke to the when the uh, you know the Sermon on the Mount was YOLO. <laughs> That would be if you were speaking today. Or sorry, it would be Yolt. You only live twice. Eternal life, everybody. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, that's anyway. definitely something. And that's not something that's just used um, in the New Testament or by Jesus. Oh, no. But like, that's something that's continued on. And people don't call them parables anymore. Um, mm-hmm. But that's what they are. Um, I mentioned the book that I was reading a while back, The Sacred Search. Um, mm-hmm. It's pretty much a self-help book. Like I wouldn't. Yeah, I guess it's kind of it's like a mixture of a theology and a self-help. Um, right. where it has practical advice for whatever, but it's also going into the backgrounds of things. Um, and all throughout that sprinkled in are just these stories of real people that this uh, writer has talked to and mm-hmm. stories of their lives. And since that book was about dating, they're all stories of relationships, how relationships went poorly, how they went well. And then he mm-hmm. would dissect those stories and you know, put them in the chapter with where they belonged. So like, you know, this couple fell apart because um, these differences or whatever, and they were able to see that. And it, it really got you into the text and understanding right. the importance of what he was saying. And it's like, oh mm-hmm. God, I don't want that to happen to me. Right. It, I should it's be not just an intangible anymore. Exactly. It's written in a way that yeah. you directly relate with it. Exactly. Um, it's not just like this idea, um, especially it's written from a Christian perspective, as I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not just this idea of like, oh, you know, a Christian and a non-Christian shouldn't date. It's it's this idea <laughs> of, 
oh, if you're a Christian and you're dating a non-Christian, you're not going to have anyone to support you in your faith. And that's going to really, really bog you down. Yeah, you're going to need to be upfront about that and figure out. (laughs) Exactly. And And so it's like things like that that people don't think about. And they're like, oh, well, you know, whatever. And I mean, people have different ideas, so I'm not arguing that. But that's kind of Mm -hmm. the things that storytelling really helps you get across because you can understand why someone is saying something that on the surface doesn't sound like it matters at all. Right. It's like, oh, that is just, you know, yeah. an intangible idea. But if exactly. you write it in the story, like, oh, it's like, oh, that could literally happen you. to me. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you see it happen, you're like, oh, man, that we should probably both be believing the same thing. <laughs> Speaking of something from a Christian point of view, mere Christianity, yeah. as we discussed, is kind of a masterful example of this technique. Um, mm-hmm. Because it, I remember when reading it, like, C.S. Lewis doesn't necessarily tell long stories. He more of uses metaphors, which are interesting they're different but related to this that if you a slightly extended metaphor can kind of be a story in of itself mm-hmm. um it kind of almost becomes a parable the line there's pretty gray one that i always remember from mere christianity is when he's talking about the idea of morality being something that is entirely personal um mm-hmm. and that so long as you are you only care about your own morality you don't need to care about the morality of people around you um which is a very popular idea and still is a very popular idea um in terms of how to look at m- morality in a society and mm-hmm. he used an analogy that I always remembered about that, which is um, ship sailing. Yes. And the idea that if one ship falls into disrepair, then its navigation course, its navigation will be thrown off course and it might run into another ship. And mm-hmm. it's the idea that you aren't just all completely individuals in society, that if one of you has a moral compass and the other doesn't, you're never going to uh, you're never going to mess each other up with the different value systems because – having a different value system than someone else could cause this type of collision. Mm-hmm. Um, and by tying it into that specific image, that little story, it like grounds it in your brain in a way other than just another idea, but gives it this truth of something that could actually happen, Absolutely. which is really interesting. Yeah. Metaphors is one of the best ways to get across a really uh, difficult concept as well. Like similar to that, like showing the importance of something, but like, so for mm-hmm. instance, if a scientist is going to start speaking to me about something right. that I don't understand, one of the best ways he can do it is put it to a metaphor, um, mm-hmm. and use objects from my life that I understand, um, right. to do that. And I, I was just thinking that cause C.S. Lewis did the same thing. Uh, the one thing that I remembered was, um, his perspective on the way God interacts with us on the right. time stream. Um, and he equated mm-hmm. it to an author and a book, um, and how right. you can open the book and you see Sally in the front, you open the book and you see Sally in the back. Sally's time stream is still going forward, but you can mm-hmm. change, you know, you can interact with it at different points in time. And so it's like right. something that will explain this big idea that you're like, oh, what? I don't, I don't, because you're, you're <laughs> Sally. Um, yeah. And yeah, people do that a lot, <laughs> a lot, especially yeah, in the academic world. It's exceedingly important to understand concepts that you don't have the necessary knowledge to understand. Um, because one alternative is you get all the prerequisite knowledge to have this explained to you, or you can have it explained to you in something you already know about, exactly. which is what people write parables <laughs> about. Something else interesting, especially when reading like nonfiction or like controversial issues, is to understand that metaphors and parables and storytelling are playing on your emotions. So yes, like, absolutely. just because something makes sense as a metaphor does not mean it's true. Like, (laughs) that's why you don't want too much of an over-reliance on metaphors, because Mm -hmm. you could make another metaphor about morality saying the complete opposite thing of that C.S. Lewis was saying, and it would be just as true. Mm -hmm. It's a way to make you understand an idea, but just because the metaphor clicks does not mean the idea is true. Exactly. And And sometimes just because the metaphor clicks in one way, it can be broken in another. And so you can't necessarily tie it to the metaphor and say, oh, well... You know, right. For instance, with the ships, it's like, well, as long as I can still steer correctly, it doesn't matter what my ship looks like on the inside. And that's. I'll just take an airplane. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) You can pull them apart real quick. So it really only works for what you're describing it as. Um, but it does come back to the idea of you having really strong metaphors because there are some times when it's just, it's just unbreakable and you're like, oh my gosh, it's actually exactly the same. Absolutely. Metaphors are, to me, much less about proving a point as much as expressing a point. Expressing and, and you illustrating. you can go on to the harder, yeah. harder job of proving it's, it. Exactly. It's usually about um, solidifying it in the reader's mind and keeping it exactly. memorable. Getting it across so they know what you're talking about so then they can debate you. Yeah, exactly. Or, or agree with you or whatever <laughs> they wish to do from and there. And they don't forget because you just said gibberish. <laughs> that's a great word. That's gibberish. a good word. I really hope it's not pronounced gibberish because that's the worst word. That would be terrible. 
Um, that would be but so it's bad. not a gif or jif, so I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Another interesting um, example of storytelling in nonfiction is an article I read recently that a friend of mine wrote. It was about Hearthstone, the uh, trading card game from Blizzard that I play a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was talking about this really popular deck that's out there right now and talking about the history of the deck. And almost all Hearthstone articles out there are just very to the point, very little like um, – very little craft to writing it. It's not that they're poorly written. They're just very utilitarian. Mm -hmm. They tell you how to play a deck. They tell you how to play it well. They tell you what cards to use, et cetera. That's very much from strategically Makes minded sense. people writing strategy. This was interesting because he opened it telling the story of this deck and the deck that came before it like an epic fantasy prologue. That's really um, cool. So it was like, let me see if I can pull some excerpts here from from the document, which I have on my computer. One second. Um, so he would just be like... Uh, the the unholy power of the deck was so great it threatened to disrupt the delicate balance established by its own creators. It's like, <laughs> this is awesome stuff. Like, what a cool way to explain this history that everyone who's reading this knows. But, like, taking the idea of, of developers nerfing cards and banning certain things and turning into this epic fantasy of how the developers were having to combat this great threat that they'd created. Mm -hmm. uh, it was such a cool idea and got me completely into the article before it even started. That's really cool. Um, so that was another example of just like even bringing it to this stuff that can seem really dry and information based mm -hmm. can still be made more interesting and relatable with storytelling. Absolutely. And that's um, that goes along with um, the idea of writing copy and writing blogs and mm -hmm. writing. Um, I see that a lot in websites um, right. when they're trying to, you know, describe their products or do something like that. They they pull in the stories because otherwise you're just reading a step by step how to guide and it's so boring. <laughs> right, and you write a lot of that kind of material yourself. That I is your job. Do. I do. So. I write mostly in emails, um, but that is actually one of the things that I try for as much as possible. Is I think, okay, <laughs> what's the point of this email? Okay, what is the story that can illustrate it? Um, and so I was actually able to do that recently um, because the the company I'm working for, I think I mentioned this before, um, mm -hmm. we're writing kind of like a guidebook for how the program works. Right. And I wanted to illustrate this story of living life on purpose. Um, and that mm -hmm. was the story that I was like, the point that I wanted to get across in the very opening. And so I found this uh, great story about Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And I got to start investigating his life and use him as my illustrator. Um, and so I'm just telling the story of his life in the most engaging way possible and then coming back down to this idea of, you know, okay, now it's time to live your life on purpose. Um, right. And everyone that I've shown it to so far has been very gripped by that. And because of that, they want to continue reading the rest of the book. And so mm -hmm. that's good marketing right there. There you go. <laughs> if I do See, say so myself. Being good at your job, that's a, a helpful, uh, <laughs> helpful attribute. But so yeah. what do you think is like the hardest part of writing with the storytelling is mine? Like what's the hardest part of marrying that with nonfiction? Um, I, I, as a, I, I started as a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I still feel like I'm a fiction writer at heart and it can be very easy for me to get lost in the story. Right. Um, so from a writer's standpoint, the hardest part is saying, oh, well, I don't need to mention this really cool thing or I don't need to go into depth about this really cool thing. I don't need to explore this really cool thing because I'm trying to sell a product. Right. And so exactly. you have to dial it down. So it's kind of the opposite. I mean, it totally is. It's totally opposite mm -hmm. of the nonfiction and storytelling, which the whole point is to explore something cool. In so, mine, I just have to pull out the parts that fit with what I'm trying to say. I just thought of something really cool in that we were talking about the differences between these and how they're opposite. Mm -hmm. And something that just popped into my mind is the perfect example for this. Think of who we brought up for nonfiction and storytelling, who we brought up for storytelling and nonfiction. We brought up Tolkien for nonfiction and storytelling. Mm -hmm. We brought up C.S. Lewis for storytelling and nonfiction. Oh, and if yeah. you look at their comparative works, Narnia is an allegory, which means he is trying to make a point mm -hmm. with a story. Like Narnia is about Christianity explicitly. Absolutely. Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien has said he hates allegory. <laughs> like Lord of the Rings is informed by his Catholic faith mm -hmm. and has messages in there, but it is not an allegory for it. It's just, that's his worldview, so he's creating a lore about it. Absolutely. And those two, like, embody these two differences, those two authors. That's a one really of them cool point. One of them is entirely focused on using nonfiction in storytelling, and the other one is entirely focused on using storytelling in his nonfiction. So it's really mm -hmm. interesting. Wow, and they were, like, friends and everything. 
And they kind of hated each other. For it. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of hated each other, but they also kind of liked each other, and it was kind of funny. Yeah, I just find it hilarious that, like, if you pick up a copy of Lord of the Rings, it has like this glowing quote on the back by uh, C.S. Lewis, and and uh, Tolkien is known to just call Narnia rubbish. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> I have to or, admit, I think Tolkien was a bit meaner to C.S. Lewis than C.S. Lewis was to Tolkien. <laughs> oh yeah, C.S. Lewis was a nice guy. Tolkien was, <laughs> was like, really you nice. know, the grumpy intellectual, but. <laughs> <laughs> in that respect, I mean, he was also a better fiction writer than C.S. Lewis. I'm Lewis not going to was... argue with that, but yeah, I do. I mostly love C.S. Lewis's um, nonfiction. Yeah, he was a much more charismatic guy. Absolutely, he was a much more like a yeah. And they were writing. It's kind of funny though because you actually see them writing for the exact same audience too. Mm-hmm. Um, because you see The Hobbit written by J.R.R. Tolkien, which was written for kids. Right. And then you see the Narnia series written by C.S. Lewis, which was also right. written for kids. And so. Based on the way that they write, you see completely different works come from it. One is very serious, and while it's kind of lighthearted and fun, um, it's mm-hmm. very logical and it all makes sense. But then you see the other side of it that's just kind of like crazy yeah. and everything from ev- <laughs> it's like the Harry Potter of his time, exactly. <laughs> just it's pulling just like, from everything. If you if you look at what they went on to write as well, it's like C.S. Or, or Tolkien went on to write a bigger world that the Hobbit like hinted at. Well, mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis went to write about Christianity, which is what the which was uh, the basis of what which he was is what Narnia about. was all about. Exactly, so it really shows what each of their works were truly about in the end. Yeah, it's really um, kind of cool. Which is a fun juxtaposition. Uh, so yeah, that should do it for this episode, man, Abigail. That was a uh, quite successful. We like, should right catch at the Stephen off mark. more often. We should. Man, we're just sitting <laughs> focused when he's not on here. <laughs> well, it was really fun, though. No, we miss yes. Stephen. We I do. love you, Stephen. He would have had so many, so many great comments. He really on all of would this. have. I think he we probably knows J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis better than both of us. That's a good point. He also, <laughs> yeah, he would have known like about all of this and had so many hilarious, insightful, witty things to say. But hey, he's not here, so you'll have to deal with us. Uh, we, we're, we're talking like he's dead. We're being really nice. <laughs> No. <laughs> but there are no tears. There are no tears. There are no tears. It is because only... he's it is not only... dead. He's still alive. Yep, exactly. The the cat woman ate him. It's a She problem. might have, but he stabbed her with a sword, so... In what furnace is his brain? All right, <laughs> so... That'll do it for this episode. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, we are, the, for the love of no, just kidding. We are Third Person <laughs> Show. Our email is thirdpersonshow at gmail.com. On YouTube, you can hopefully find this episode <laughs> and other recent episodes at Third Person a Storytelling Podcast. If it isn't updated by now, I apologize. We're, we're working through that. Well, uh, I mean, we if, are. If, if you're listening to this and it, and it has, if you're listening to this on YouTube and it hasn't been put on YouTube yet. That's weird. Uh, we're impressed. We're really impressed. Like, that means super you, cool, and that we means you, you took podcast. the file and uploaded it yourself. Exactly. So email us and tell that us how you did that. That is copyright infringement, sir. Give me that back. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, or sir or ma'am. I'm sorry. I don't oh. mean to be sexist on who knows how to upload to YouTube. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> <where else are we? laughs> That's so bad. I know. It's pretty dumb. Uh, Whales are Whales. We are a production of the Whales are Whales Network. Check out whalesarewhales.com for other awesome shows like this with other awesome people like us. Um, speaking of awesome people like us, if you want to follow me personally on Twitter, I am Lord Meldor. That is L-O-R-D-M-E-L-D-O-R-R. Stephen, who is not here, my brother, is Stephen Kelly, 180. And Abigail is the thinky reader. Um, so those are all our... our respective twitter handles Woo-hoo. and yeah that'll do it. oh yeah and you can check out abigail's blog at uh is it aimless hyperbole it is. dot wordpress or do nope, you just own the just actual dot com aimless, aimless hyperbole. Hyperbole. Dot com. if you awesome. if you want more examples of storytelling in nonfiction, that's a lot of what i do um yep on that blog so that is true that is true and i wish i could say i write a bunch of nonfiction to story but i don't not no. yet i wish i i should write more uh like uh epic fantasy hey, really yeah you really should I totally That was actually that. the first thing I remember writing seriously was an epic fantasy because I that's think what, that's everybody's. Yeah, first that's thing. what everyone. That's what Stephen wrote first. That's what I wrote first. <laughs> it's All funny because right. mine was a mixture of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Well, okay, so here's the kind of dumb thing, and this is kind of off topic, so I won't go on too long about this. But when when Stephen and I were young, we just wrote a bunch of like interesting, um, like uh, almost. Completely weird, almost surreal, like just short stories. Because mm-hmm. um, that's what you do when you're young. You just write yeah. whatever interesting to you. Um, and so those were interesting. We didn't complete all of them, but they were really cool uh, and original and funny in their own, like, you know, childish sort of way. Then when Stephen decided he was going to be a serious writer, I put that in quotation marks, he started writing an epic fantasy. Yeah. And it was like really generic. 
And it's like, why did you lose that extra one? And it's not like, and for some reason, people <laughs> think when they actually start writing, they suddenly have to become boring. Absolutely. And they suddenly have to write like everyone else. They have to like um, create the entire world and then go yeah. and do it. Like, no, no, no. That's not what a baby writer does. That's what a papa writer does. start writing. That's the fun <laughs> thing. Anyone who's about to start, who's interested in writing, that is just my, my number one advice to you. Just keep writing. It's the same thing I do in songwriting. Mm-hmm. When you get stuck on something, move just on to writing. something else and try it. Even if the words you're saying you don't like make yet. any sense. Like just keep right. typing words and eventually they will. And then you can fix it in post. Right. And just keep trying different genres because maybe you're a, like a noir writer and you just don't know yeah. it yet because you never tried it. So like, just keep writing whatever's most interesting. That's what I do with songwriting. Mm-hmm. I'm an amateur musician, so I'm not going to like be making stuff for movies or something. I just start writing whatever I'm interested in doing at the time. Yep. I never um, thought I'd be a nonfiction writer, but it turns out to be the majority of what I do these days. There you go. So that's your end of episode pep talk. <laughs> types of listening to this. For go all you writers you out do. there who are not just readers. Right. Or anything else. You make videos or something, send them our way. Yeah. I'd love to see them. And uh, just make what you love to make and uh, see what comes of it. Um, and yeah, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Abigail, for, for joining me here. Oh, you're welcome. It was such a sacrifice. I know it was. You are. You <laughs> don't have much time these days. I appreciate it. Well, that's true. But this was probably like the highlight of my day. So we're. This is good. Yeah, actually, same here. So yay <laughs> us. Uh, we're awesome. We will, we will be back in two weeks with our new biweekly schedule. So we will see you all soon. And in the meantime, no, uh, no, no. We have to have a an outro. We're it's not, like a tradition at this we're point. We're not hugging any books, though. We're not hugging. You know, for you the outro. Go hug C.S. Lewis. I am going to read you the entirety of The Tiger by William Blake. <laughs> tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. It's from 19, uh, 1794, so I think copyright's expired. Okay. okay. Tiger, also, Tiger is spelled with a Y. Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the forest.